Hey Achievers, this is Maya, founder of Healthy High Achievers. Join our global community and create healthier routines to avoid burnout and feel more calm and healthy. Let's get to it. Hey Achievers, welcome back to the Healthy High Achievers podcast. And today we have Dana Wildeboer here. She's the Vice President of Global Marketing and Communications for Mass Challenge. And she is a true Healthy High Achiever. I wanted to have her today on the podcast because in the past, she was a world record holding power lifter. She survived cancer. She produced the first TEDx event and she didn't live in any one place for longer than two years between the ages of 18 and 40. Now, I know this is a big question, Dana, but how in the world did you get the power to do all that? I mean, somewhere just deep down inside some intrinsic motivation that lives within me. But I think it really all goes back to um, my childhood. And I think one of the things that my family really instilled in me was that I was honestly capable of doing anything. And um, I've just had over my lifetime have gotten really good at just being like, okay, the next step forward and learning that remaining present allows me to understand that I'm okay. And that my anxiety is future focused. I can't really control the future and anything else is probably coming from the past. Stress is usually triggered by something in the past, but the past, not none of that exists right here in this moment. And so these are not skills that I honed until very late in life. I was very much a a white knuckler, uh, as my coach likes to say now, and I just, I knew how to grit and bear it. I was an athlete as a child, uh, and then a competitive cheerleader until I was 25, continued through my powerlifting career as as a competitive athlete. So aligning myself toward a goal and doing whatever it took was just part it was just part of my grooming as a child if you will um and now as a as a full-fledged adult and career-oriented professional i see how that benefited me but i see how that strategy is not my best path forward and i'm better off focusing here in the present and continuing to take one step forward towards the goal Mm, yeah because i can imagine being an athlete and then a power lifter and then all that that's like really competition sports and pushing your body all the time and I know other people in the sports world they recognize that that you just constantly you're pushing your limits right so was that something that you had to unlearn or what was that like to have that mentality from your childhood already and then entering business and life and realizing oh I actually need to be in the here and now and not push. Yeah. um, So learning to flow was a big challenge for me. Absolutely. Uh, And probably something I got acquainted with in my mid thirties. And again, not something I really learned until later in my mastered, shall we say, until later in my thirties. The biggest flip for me was when I was going through all the health complications. I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. I had to have my kidney taken out. Um, Healing from that, because I had a bunch of surgeries prior, my incisions did not heal right. And I ended up with a massive ventral hernia. And I mean, I couldn't, I had to have my abdominal wall reconstructed and uh, Yeah. So the recovery period from that, I couldn't even sit up. Right. So I just had to just had to let what was going to happen happen because I literally could not do and function the way that I was used to. And so that was over three years ago now. So three years ago now in 2019, but that was really the first lesson, like the first true moment for me where I remember being like, okay, I'm going to have to accept that I am human and my body needs a rest and it is, well, it's going to take whatever rest it needs right now. And Mm -hmm. through that, I learned to like, let go of my need to control every little detail, which makes me a better manager actually, because people feel more compelled and empowered to bring their ideas to the table versus executing a vision that I have put forth. And it's made my career a lot more fun too. Wow. And it's interesting to hear that through your health struggles, you really learn how to give your body the rest it needs. 
and to and that helps you become a better manager so that's a beautiful example of how all these different life experiences and job experiences all influence each other and influence other areas of your life because you would have probably never thought that your health issues would have sort of helped you in the professional world afterwards no i didn't in the <laughs> moment i thought it was a really big inconvenience and mm. how dare you not let me go to this event i mean i i've had five abdominal surgeries over the course of like two and a half years or something like that and i remember after the first one on a sunday like two days after the surgery i went and presented for my company at an event on a Sunday morning. <laughs> I think back to it now and I'm like, my gosh, it was crazy. That was so stupid. I should have stayed in bed. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely, uh, I don't remember where the where this started, but I've definitely, yeah. in that, that old mindset did some pretty intense things. Exactly that of what, um, an athlete would say, right, of, of like, I can do this, you know, I can push through, I can do this, it will be all right, you know, I can rest afterwards, you know, it's not that bad. <laughs> yep, 100%. And honestly, I mean, that's something I talk about now openly, um, having been an athlete for so long is being athletic and having an athletic lifestyle is one thing, but being a competitive athlete that needs to operate at the top of their game 100% of the time, that's actually not very healthy. And you will hear a lot of professional athletes and former Olympic medalists talk about that now because uh, you really are just pushing yourself to the break and to the limits 100% of the time and emotionally, spiritually, and physically, you can only handle so much of that and, and your being will push back eventually. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me about that shift. I know there are many people in the audience that are still, that still have the tendency to push themselves. And I really feel you here, Dana, because I grew up with competition sports and jump rope, actually. It was, it was eight oh. hours a week. It was for, since I was a kid, I was like six when I started. So I really grew up with that mentality of pushing, pushing, pushing and saying, I cannot do this meant that we had to do 10 push-ups. So I learned to never ever say, I cannot do this until I had my own health struggles and fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. And I had to learn how to say, I can't do this. You know, I have to rest. I have to listen to my body. So for people who are still pushing themselves and a bit perfectionistic and kind of think I can do, you know, they think they're superhuman, high achievers, right? How was that transition for you to go from I can do everything to, okay, I can raise myself, I can listen to myself while still busy being in that business world? You know, that's what's amazing to me. You're, you're still in that fast paced management world. Yeah. Um, well, I, it's amazing when you have to let your body heal and you can't do the athletic stuff, how much more space you have for the professional or career and career oriented work that you wanted to be focused on. So, um, you know, this all happened for me pre COVID. So as I was healing, COVID was hitting and the world was transitioning into this, uh, this isolation phase that we're all, uh, peaking our heads out of now. And um, I guess for me, that was actually a blessing because I had to attend events online or I had to do my networking online. So I think for me, there was some divine intervention there to make sure that I had not only the time and the space, but the rest of the world was operating under the same constraints that I was. Um, mm -hmm. And now that we're coming out of that, it's I, my husband and I have since left Texas where we were living when that was all going down. And now we live in Utah. Um, and so it's really cool to come out of that and start to get to meet some of these people in, in real life, um, whether it's by going to visit them in places or maybe they're right here locally. There are some Facebook friends that I have made in the Utah area over the course of that time that I'm like, hey, totally random, but I live here now. We should, we should hang out. Um, but the actual process, like what it felt like for me and how, uh, and how I learned to address it. I mean, I, 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 I would say I was in a depressive state for a really long time because this huge part of who I was 
And where I exerted the other 50% of my energy just all of a sudden wasn't there. And so it felt very unbalanced for me at first to really be filling this time with work. Yeah. Um, but through that, through that opportunity was how I learned how to ask for help because I, I needed the help from people because I was stuck in front of a computer. Um, so I learned how to ask for help. And I also learned that most people don't say no when you ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, and so for those who are still feeling like I have to do it all, I have to, I have to be perfect about it. Um, a few points of advice are one, always just ask, ask for help. It does take a lot, but very rarely do people say no, I have learned. And that's really empowering to know that you have that support around you. And if anything, for me, it like breathed more confidence into what I was doing. And mm -hmm. I felt stronger in the efforts that I was doing, but also no one's shame or embarrassment is, 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 is as strong as our own. So I might have felt a, ashamed of having to ask for help or being embarrassed to not to, you know, shift a deadline or something. But the reality is, is nobody else was ashamed or embarrassed about <laughs> it except for me. And they were all having similar moments, maybe not over the same project, but over something else. And so really owning that, like, my experience is mine and mine alone and other people it's very unlikely they even notice was mm -hmm. a like world changing for me yeah realizing that you the way you think about yourself or the way you beat yourself up when you can't do it right mm -hmm. it's almost never the thoughts that other people are having about your experience and about what you're doing so that it's not the reality it's just your mind and your expectations on yourself basically and realizing that that's not the same as other people's expectations of you was that also sort of like one of the biggest shifts for you oh yeah well don't get me wrong I still have very high expectations of myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and all yeah. the things I do I just I approach it differently right I understand how the building blocks come together now um and that you really are stronger as part of a community versus um versus as doing it all alone and, and white knuckling your way through it and also mm -hmm. I guess this aligns to that I mean one universal truth of life is impermanence right we're all born but we're also all going to die like every everything ends and yeah. so for some reason we are taught to dread or fear or be ashamed of this one universal truth of life but I mean like Every, everyone, everyone passes on. Everything has a life cycle, whether it's a business, a social media channel. I mean, everything has a life cycle. So instead of being afraid of it and accepting that that is a truth in life, you know, and that is one truth we all have in common really helped me flip even my mindset around what loss meant. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, being able to accept the recent I had a grandmother pass away recently and I was just so at peace with it because the end of her story was completely on her terms. She was 92 years old. She was placed on hospice care and she had her uh, priest come over and he, she said to him, I'm done. I'm ready for God to take me now. And I oh. kid you not, three days later, she had passed on, but it was 100% on her terms and like, what a cool way to go right? You, she wasn't afraid of it. She was completely accepting of this one thing that we're all going to experience at some point. And that just like kind of makes, brings a little bit of levity to everything. It makes it a, you can see the humor in the chaos a little bit easier mm. when you understand like we've all got the same end result. Everything, every life cycle ends at some point. Wow. Yes. And that finding that comfort or just flow in the chaos, I had to learn that here in Peru. And what you're saying about your grandmother too, it gives me goosebumps because I lost my grandmother very recently. Also age. And the funny thing is, I feel quite at peace with it because we had said our goodbyes like six years ago. When I mm -hmm. first left for Peru, we had that um, exchange of, we had that look in our eyes of, okay, I think, I think this is going to be the last time, right? 
And then every time I went back to Belgium to visit my fam family, she was still there, you know, fighting and, and, you know, with health issues, but still going. And so now that she was in her last days and also just naturally um, left this world, it was, of course, the initial shock. But then afterwards, I felt a peace and I just visualized in a meditation, like giving her one big hug and wishing her the best. And just I felt more peaceful than I thought I would because I knew it was her time and I knew mm -hmm. you know that was just nature but it's hard it's like you said it adds a bit of lightness somehow and humor to the serious stuff in life like when mm -hmm. people ask my are you gonna stay in Peru forever I'm like for now this is my forever but who knows in five years time what I'm going to feel like, right? I have no clue. Maybe I'll be in Brazil or back in Belgium or somewhere, somewhere in the U.S., right? <laughs> Maybe I'll be in Utah and I'll ask you to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a really cool place. No, so what would you bring up about, you know, how, how you feel? I think for me, that was the biggest disconnect is that when I was white knuckling it, my feelings were much more on the negative spectrum, uh, anxiety, stress overwhelm and versus now where I'm in flow like I feel things I still feel things very intensely I'm very much an empath like I have hard mm -hmm. emotions um but I am able to see it differently and and what used to stress me out I now laugh at and I'm like I get paid to do that how lucky am I <laughs> like, this, wow, is, yes. this is crazy but I get that like this is crazy but this this is my life and I'm blessed in the sense that I get to do the, the work that I do um, with the founders that I work with who are really shifting industries and economies across the globe. Um, and, and it's just fun now because I've let go of that control and I have faith in myself and my capabilities. Mm. And again, they're going with that flow. And just feeling yeah. like you're getting paid for what you like doing and, and taking it not too seriously. Because I can imagine that many empaths, I'm one myself, and I I know we have many in the audience of healthy I achieve this because it can be overwhelming um, to have that drive, have that motivation, enthusiasm, but then getting overwhelmed by it and not sure and doubting and just too intense, too many impulses, right? So doing everything you've done and then moving countries so often and I want to talk about that too like kind of how you moved so many countries between your 18 and 40 how did you deal with that as an empath just the overwhelm and, and so many different experiences in the business world I mean that was just my natural state right so as in it, my my mother and family taught me awesome lessons as a child, but I also came from a divorced family, had an alcoholic and emotionally abusive father who I stopped talking to very early in my preteen years. So I was just an angsty, angry child for a very long time. And my inputs uh, through sports and my outputs through a competitive, like being this, having that success and always leaning into that competitive edge definitely came from a place of abandonment and not enoughness. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, that was my just state of mind, right? That's all I knew, all I understood. I, I can think back and see distinct moments in my twenties when I was living in Los Angeles and opportunities to understand wellness and mindfulness would cross my path and I'd be like nope no way I'm too focused I've got to white knuckle it through this thing and then I'm not like at 35 like my body was just like or I guess it was 37 by that time I finally accepted it all my body was like no 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 you're done and now we're switching gears like I I didn't have a choice so mm -hmm. it I would have believed, I believe that if I did not dive in deep and understand my belief systems and my triggers, like I would have continued down that path and it probably would have caused me a heart attack at some point in time. Cause I was just so all the time. Mm, yeah. So you really feel like it was your body sort of screaming at you. Mm -hmm. What did that feel like? I mean, it did not feel good. <laughs> it physically hurt. Uh, to the point now where if I, if I have uh, any sort of abdominal cramp, I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> that's, 
that's what drove me to the doctor to begin with. Um, when I was diagnosed with cancer is I would get these intense abdominal cramps and I didn't know what they were from. And I thought it was, you know, I had a hernia repair recently before it started. So I thought maybe it was from that hernia repair, but no, I had a, I had a very large softball sized tumor in my kidney. Um, and then it's, I'm not kidding. As soon as they took it out, like I felt so much better. And so it, for me, I was, a, I attached uh, symbolism to like all that toxicity that I had been carrying around from my life of abandonment and not enoughness and always having to be the competitive asshole to prove my worthiness. Um, you know, for me, I kind of like, actually, it was actually like that stuff just came, came away. And I didn't develop this mindset just on my own. I just was like, I don't want to ever feel like this again. What do I have to do to not feel like this? And I started looking at people who seemed to be at peace and who were happy and just had a different mindset for life. And that, and that's who I started working with, whether it was my therapist or I have a a coach now and doctors that looked at medicine differently and more holistically and honored the web that is your physical body, but also your human spirit. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's been an adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, you just look for, you ask yourself that question, how can I do this differently? How can I think or feel differently about everything in my life? And the, I love how you say the not enoughness <laughs> you go through life and then just being very competitive and trying to compensate I guess for mm -hmm. that feeling of worth and you were just looking for ways to find your peace and I did the same I went to therapy in the beginning because I didn't know where to turn to I didn't know where to find that and she did like teach me about highly sensitive people and perfectionism and being your own best friend you know those first blogs that you need to have in place and then you just kind of go on that journey like doctors like you said you know I became a functional medicine certified health coach because we know that it's not only the body it's not only the mind it's kind of both it's a bit of everything and it's always a combination and um, that's where you really find that whole answer of okay it is your body screaming at you it is stuff reflecting what's happening in your mind is happening in your body and it's all it's all very just, very interconnected yeah way more than we think it is still yeah yeah for sure and so your life moving around from country to country how did that happen and what did you like why <laughs> why did you do that <laughs> well, it was so state long? to state it was okay. state to state in the, in the U.S. it was state to state but I was born just outside of Philadelphia and I spent the first 25 years of my life there and then I graduated from college and um, college actually was a huge door opener for me so well, the first time I left home was to go live in a dorm room which about 20 minutes away but mm -hmm. from a hometown where people like don't really leave to do anything um, and if they do they 100% come back and by going to college I got exposed to a whole lot of different perspectives and mm -hmm. definitely did not understand what they were at the time but was curious enough to be like okay I'll I'll, I'll tag along with you to go to this different class or go see this speaker. And um, because of my best friend, actually, that's how I ended up in Los Angeles after uh, college, because we were both film students and she went to the American Film Institute and all of the things aligned right and she had a room available in her apartment and I landed a, an interview for a really good job like right before I was supposed to move out um, and so those two experiences like really shifted the world that I knew and uh, was terrifying at first honestly super terrifying um, because I, it was shaking everything up that I knew coming from this small suburban pretty white bread town uh, into like the inner cities of Philadelphia and Los Angeles, which were pretty different. Um, and so why did I move was just because that's just what I knew, right? Like that's, mm. that's just what happened. So, um, you know, 
moving in and out of college dorms and different on campus and on camp off campus housing for the six years that it took me to get through college. And then when I was in LA, I only had leases that were for a year. So I moved every year for the five years that I was in LA. And then I moved back to Philadelphia, but I realized how uh, that was not aligned with who I was as a person anymore. And so I decided to move to Austin, Texas. But again, I and it's like, I wasn't setting roots anywhere and mm -hmm. looking at all of this now, I can look back and be like, oh, that was that like abandonment trigger and that not enoughness and people are just going to leave you. It's not worth setting down roots and really investing in these relationships. Um, and that served me for a while, but it doesn't uh, anymore. And so my husband and I, we just bought a house in Utah. So we're setting roots and when we were going through that process for both of us, it was like, um, what just happened? This is really <laughs> weird. I can, I can hang stuff on the walls. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I can, I can make friends with people because he left, he left high school and went into the army. Right. And so he moved around a bunch too, until our paths crossed in Austin. But even then, like he went to College Station to finish his degree at Texas A&M and I was still in Austin. And so, yeah, it was, it was been a, a whirlwind there for 20 some odd years, but it feels good to be grounded now. Wow. Yes. And I just, I always remind people who are like, no, but like traveling other countries, I want to stay here or there. Just think of that simple fact of what you've been doing, you know, going from your going to another city or even just another apartment within the same city or another neighborhood and just experiencing those different corners of your own country and I mean the U.S. is like every state is so different so that is oh, so, so different <laughs> from what I hear you know it's all every state is a country in itself so just that if those different perspectives it might have come from your fear of abandoning or, or, or your past traumas, but it did bring you that, your curiosity did also trigger that, hey, you know, let me explore this. Hey, let me you know, learn from this. Kind of learning from everything you see and creating your own reality in the way that fits, fits you best and better than the place where you grew up, basically. Yeah, uh, that's a really good way. That's a really great way to summarize it for sure. Um, and I think for me, part of why that more transient experience worked was because it was the first time in my life uh, where I where I could ask why or how come or get curious about something without being ridiculed for asking a question because you know children are seen, not heard. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm um I'm so grateful that you also came onto that healthy high achievers came onto your path and that you found us to just share your story because this is so inspiring and and tell us what are you doing right now? You said that you were also working more on yourself right now, starting your own thing. Yeah, so uh, while I'm working on learning how to tell this story, so putting myself out there much more You did a great job. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That is something I want to do. Um, I'm actually working on creating an online content business where I can share these lessons in a scalable way with uh, people who are having similar experiences as I did. I think I offer a lot around resiliency that uh, mm -hmm. that people can learn from. And so, uh, I mean, I'm months away from launching that project. It's just something I started taking on about three weeks ago, actually. Um, and outside of that, I am still VP of global marketing and communications for Mass Challenge. So really diving in there and helping to build that brand up to the global status because that that we have, um, we operate in seven different countries, well, in over 18 countries, and we have seven offices across the world. So I want to make sure people know about Mass Challenge and uh, how you can also help the next generation of innovators. All right. Yes. And I, I'm just looking forward to hearing more of your stories. Definitely keep me updated. Send me emails and stuff about the course or the content you're going to put out. 
about your own journey and resiliency. I recognize so much of my own story in you, and that's just a very, very beautiful um, mirror, kind of similar hair to like. <laughs> yeah, I noticed, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> people can see it on YouTube, by the way, if they're listening on the podcast. <laughs> but um, yeah, and if, just, it, if it, I was gonna say, if anyone wants to follow along, all my handles on Instagram and Twitter are at Startup Sweet B. So um, love to connect. Yeah, perfect. Make sure you send them all through to me. I'll put them in the show notes. People, check her out. Uh, she's going to be putting out this content about resiliency, all that inspiration that you heard about today. Um, thank you so much, Dana. You are a healthy high achiever. And often healthy high achievers had to go through a whole lot of, <laughs> not going to say the word, in life um, yeah. before reaching that point. But that's how you learn. That's how you grow. And that's how you become a person who can pass that through to others, inspire others on platforms like this one. So thank you so much. This was very inspiring. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. Absolutely. Dear Achievers, I hope you liked this episode. If you did, please subscribe and share with your friends, anyone who needs to hear this. You're super welcome to join us at healthyhighachievers.community as well. See you there.